Welcome to Careers with Miss V. Today we are speaking with Kevin Pereira, who is the Managing Director of Blue Artificial Intelligence. And he's zooming in from Hong Kong. I'm so excited to have you with me today, Kevin. Welcome to Careers with Miss V. Perfect. Thank you for having me very much. So before we get into the details of, of what you do at Blue Artificial Intelligence, I know I have a lot of questions in terms of the trend kind of conversations that are going around about future of careers and, and jobs being replaced by AI. I do want to get into the truth behind some of those conversational pieces. But before I do that, I thought we could take you back to your younger years when you were beginning to explore your future career. Sure, yeah. So, you know, uh, maybe a little bit of background myself, right? So I was born and raised in Hong Kong. I went to international school over here. And for the subjects that I studied for sort of uh, A-levels, I was taking um, you know, more stuff on the more science side of things. So math, physics, uh, I really liked economics and business as well. So I was, that was sort of the area I was interested in. And that kind of led me to ultimately my university choices. Uh, and so I, I initially uh, started my uh, college sort of undergrad at the University of Michigan in, Ar in Ann Arbor. And then a year after that, I transferred over to the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. So that was a really good sort of education into business fundamentals, what actually happens kind of, you know, when companies and organizations are really thinking and considering business. So I concentrated in finance management and marketing there. So a little bit of a wide discipline in terms of business, but I really wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do. So I thought, you know, keep the uh, keep the options open at that point. So I started the career over in finance uh, and wor worked at uh, private banking over with City in New York. And so private banking, it has... Uh, some elements of investments and finance and your hardcore math. And it also has some softer skills as well, which is more related to client building, uh, client, I'd say, relationship building. And then also uh, things along the lines of, you know, building trust with people and just your general EQ and people skills. So enjoyed doing that for, uh, for a few years. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, spent some time uh, after that in Hong Kong, working in a similar role in asset management, uh, more on the product side. Uh, and then I got the chance to go to MBA school. So that was actually a lot of fun as well. Uh, I went to a school called INSEAD. They have a campus in France and a campus in Singapore and sort of continued my business education through that. Uh, probably concentrated a little bit more on the software skill side of things at INSEAD rather than finance because I'd already done that before. And I really liked INSEAD because it was a very uh, multicultural I had a very multicultural student body as well. So there were uh, students from countries I'd never heard of before. And what I really found interesting there was the different perspectives that people bought. Uh, you know, the wide international background means people think differently. They've been educated differently. And although I don't necessarily agree with them on everything, I still think it was really good to take a step back and listen. Right? I think that that was one of the things that INSEAD helped me a lot with. So post INSEAD, I uh, wanted to... Um, you know, not go into finance and also work, uh, have a bit of an adventure in terms of career. So I went to work in Myanmar. I was doing internet infrastructure there, and it was really a jump into technology. It was kind of the main point of, of going to business school. So enjoyed uh, that transition. It was a lot of fun and also gave me some uh, exposure to emerging markets. So I, before that, I kind of lived and worked in major cities. And so going to Myanmar was on the sort of extreme edge of frontier markets. So that was also really interesting, and I'm happy to talk about uh, some of the experiences there. And then currently, I work at Blue Artificial Intelligence. I'm the managing director there, and we talk to companies about the strategy, and then we suggest to them where we can add AI on top of that. Uh, and in addition to that, I also do a lot of uh, education work as well, both with Blue. And I also teach at a number of schools in, uh, in Hong Kong and the region at the university level for MBAs and master's students. So yeah, that's the uh, not-so-short introduction. Um, but happy to talk about any of the experiences and, and anything you'd like to uh, with regards to those. I think the depth of experiences that you've just described to me confirm the things that I've been telling young people all along is that, you know, when you leave secondary school, that first thing that you do is definitely not the last thing that you do. And, and I think that helps to ease the anxiety. Would you say that in your experience, that would have been similar that now that you're looking back, you think, wow, I wish somebody told me, or maybe I wish I could have believed it more that that first step wasn't going to be my final step. Yeah, you know, I've had quite a few times when the road was, uh, I guess, you know, you had to get to not necessarily go straight to the final destination, you had to take a little bit of a, of a detour. I think part of that is good from a life experience perspective as well. 
Because half of, I, I think, life in general is really about the journey, right? So, for example, even when I was thinking about universities, um, I think my top pick at, in high school was, was Wharton. Um, but then, you know, I didn't get in there and I was kind of sad about that. Um, but when I went to the University of Michigan, there were so many other opportunities that I would not have got had I just to go to Wharton straight away. I mean, one example, you know, the, is the college football games and the college spirit that you see in the U.S., um, I think at a big state school like Michigan, it's fantastic. Uh, it's a little bit less sort of emphasized at Penn. So I would have never got that experience had I to just, you know, have gotten to the thing I originally thought um, uh, would be have, would have been the best for me. So I think, you know, I'd say being a little bit more open to some of those diversions that you have along the journey is, is, is useful. And um, yeah, I'm really a believer that kind of everything happens for a reason. And you just sometimes you only see the reason after you finish the uh, finish the journey or that part of it. Definitely, and and I want to pick up on that idea of the journey because there there are, it's debatable it, depending on the educator you speak to or the professional or even the parent. This idea of preparing young people for future careers is either held by someone in full agreement or held by another and in, in kind of saying, "Well, I didn't have that. Look, I I turned out fine." So picking up on that and really looking at what you do in, in AI, it is, a different, it is a different destination right now. And I wonder, as you are also an educator, how do you or what camp are you really advocating for in terms of helping young people to understand? And, and I don't believe that we should be focusing on how this big mountainous AI is going to be taking over our world more than how to help young people become adaptable to changes and look at their careers from that lens. But how, how does that land with you? And what, what are some of your perspectives? How would you help a young person? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, my view on a lot of learning kind of going forward and, and people's mindsets and mentalities is number one, we need to be open. But number two, I really believe that the future of work is about the combination of the AI and the technology and also the human as well. And so rather than fight it, i.e. trying to be better at the machine than something, I think we need to think about what are we, um, com in terms of strengths, how are we complementary to the AI? I think that's the important part. And so if we start to go around, along that route, then a lot of what I tell my students is really to think about, A, within the career that you have, or within the job that you have, you know, what are the skills or tasks that are easy to automate there? And if you think that job or that area has a lot of automatable tasks, then be mindful of that because going forward, AI can have a really big sort of negative impact there. But I think there are other areas where that's a little bit harder to do. So I think skill sets, for example, that are hard to replicate or automate are perhaps things like, um, uh, you know, trust building, for example, right? I think that's a really big one. Uh, I think also being able to be creative, right? I think that whole idea of being inspired to do something and, you know, getting an extra 20% in terms of uh, ability or, or, or effort, I think that is hard to replicate with an AI. So I think when, when we're kind of thinking about, you know, technology's impact and what should young people do in the future, I think one, be open to new tools that are out there. Don't be afraid to use them and, and play around with them. Uh, B, don't view AI as a threat. I think view it more as something that's going to make you better, uh, but you've got to figure out how, to, how it's going to make you better, right? And, and I think that's where human adaptability is interesting because we have more uh, things we can do, whereas the AI is pretty narrow. And so generally when you have AI, uh, we, we talk about AI in the context of narrow AI, meaning that can do one specific tasks or set of tasks very well and just that. So then the question is, there's so much more that goes around that task, and that's really where the humans can, you know, uh, have more of an impact. So I would say for younger people today, uh, you know, the idea is be more, be open and, uh, and, and really kind of think about where you're a good complement to the technology that's out there. So I, this, I like how you just brought this up about AI being for really specific tasks and being really good at specific tasks. And, and I'm reflecting back to conversations I've had in the past with guests who have told me, you know, young people tend to look at those super large organizations and want to work for them. But actually, when you work for those organizations, you're really specializing and honing in on a specific task. So I'm now wondering, is this 
better for young people to really not just look at AI in terms of how can I adapt to it, but also what type of an organization would be more prone to replacing the career that I want to have with AI and maybe looking at small, medium enterprises, knowing that A, they might not be able to afford all of the AI technology and B, they might be looking for individuals that can really have multi-skills and be looking at taking on multiple tasks. Would you say that that's something of interest that a young person should not just be looking at AI as AI, but also where can I help an organization and where would I be more employable in terms of not being replaced for that specific task? Yeah, that's a really good question, right? Um, I think if we think about maybe that issue and, and break it down a little bit, right? So the first question I think is big organization versus small organization. And my view on a lot of that, and, and perhaps this is not necessarily what uh, the mainstream would advocate, uh, but I do think that working at a bigger place initially at the start of your career is actually a good thing. I think part of why I say that is because many of the larger firms have like established sort of training programs, right? For maybe the management associates or just like the incoming either uh, school uh, folks or university folks as well. And uh, it's my view that I think some of that initial training they give is actually really good, right? So I do think starting your career at a, at a more established place, in my view, gives you a good grounding. But I think what quickly happens though is it's, it's pretty easy to get comfortable in a job and just do the same thing over and over again. And I think this is where you'll have a little bit of a diversion, right? So there'll be some people who are really comfortable doing the same thing over and over again, and I'm not criticizing them. I think that's a personal choice that all of us sort of have to make. Like if, you, if you're okay with that and, and that's what you want to do, it's totally fine, knock yourself out. Um, I do think though that some people eventually realize that doing the similar kind of job with similar clients and similar people is not something that they find, you know, um, a, a thing that they'll wake up in the morning with a lot of energy for. And I think if you find that that's you after one or two years at a job like this, then that's a sign, right? And that's a sign that you are probably looking to embrace something a little bit different. So I think with the smaller firms, what becomes interesting is there's a lot less structure there. So with a lot less structure, that means you're not just in the marketing department. Today, you're in the marketing department. Tomorrow, it could be finance. Tomorrow, it, and the day after, it's wherever you need it to. Some people find that really exciting. Some people find that really scary. I mean, I, I saw a little bit of that, actually, during my experience in Myanmar, where although I came in to be more on the finance side, I, ha I had like 17 different hats, right? And you're running around all the time. And there were a couple of other people who were also in my situation, and some of them really hated it. And so I think that was probably pretty tough for, for a few. Uh, but then I think some others embraced it and they said, you know, this is fantastic. Um, there's never a day where I'm bored. Uh, there's maybe a day where I'm confused in terms of not knowing exactly what to do, but that's all part of the fun and part of the excitement. So that lack of structure versus structure is something that I think a lot of people need to figure out when it comes to big company versus small company. I think in terms of the embracing of technology for big and small, um, yeah, I think the variance is probably larger with bigger companies. So I think you have some large companies that are really on the cutting edge and want to pull in a lot of tech. Uh, and then there are a lot of other big companies who are very slow, right? So that within the big company selection, I think you need to think a little bit about that. I think for a small and medium-sized enterprise with regards to AI, um, I think you're right. A lot of small and medium-sized companies don't have the budgets for really big sort of AI projects. So I think there you might see a little bit less of AI and a little bit more focus on the human piece of what they're trying to do. So, yeah, I mean, I think those are some of the considerations you want to think about when you're thinking big versus small, and then also AI in the big versus AI in the small. Brilliant. Let's go into some of your top tips. Developing emotional resilience is one, getting a good mentor and staying open to continuous learning through your life. Now, in terms of wearing that AI hat, who is a good mentor? Like, I'm really thinking about mentorship in terms of AI. So a young person today preparing themselves for work, say in five years, you know, in five years, is there really today, is there really a mentor who can help a young person prepare for something that's going to happen five years from now? And I know that this is where that debate kicks in when we're talking with young people, parents and educators, is that 
we're constantly putting this added pressure, but in reality, how are we really preparing for young people for those changes because they're happening at such a fast pace? How would you respond to that? Sure. So I think with regards to mentors, right? Um, I actually think not much will change uh, with regards to AI being there. And, and part of why I say that is because with any AI solution, you need the tech side of things, but then you also need, um, I would say, the subject matter experts there as well, right? So if your mentors, for example, are subject matter experts in a certain area, I actually think that's a really good thing to have. And in my view, from a, from a mentor, uh, you know, in that mentor relationship, I really feel that having someone who's very competent in their area is a fantastic thing to have because you really get to learn from them. And part of that could be the conversations you have with them. Part of them could also be working with them, right? And, and the example that I have of one of my top mentors just in life, uh, he was actually the private banker who I was working with uh, when I started, joint, when I started uh, on the relationship side at City. And this guy, uh, Maria, if you, if you meet him, and you have a 15-minute conversation with him, he, you will literally just take out your wallet and be like, Frank, invest my money. And why he was so good at what he did is because his EQ and his people skills were fantastic. I had never seen anybody like that. And I remember when I was working with him, there were times when I would go home and I'd read like psychology books because that was an area of interest for me. And you know, as you see kind of how you, how you create comfort with people, how you really build trust, you know, I would flick through the book and all of a sudden, you know, page 47, and I would, I would see exactly what Frank did in the meeting that morning, right? So he was just really good at that one thing. And it was great to, it was great to hear and talk to him about it, but it was another thing to actually see him in action and learn from him as well. So I do think on the mentor side, a lot of the good mentors, in my view, will actually have skills that are hard to automate. And so if you can really have mentors that, that are able to hone those skills and show you, show you them in action, I think that's really helpful. And so even nowadays, I often think back to my times with Frank at meetings with clients, especially when maybe delivering like bad news. And then I can think about how did he deal with that situation and maybe how I can deal with the situation here too. So I think on the mentor side, you know, definitely uh, look, for, look for folks who have skills that you want to develop. Right, because I think that provides a really good platform for you to then take in some of those skills, either by osmosis, just being next to them for a long time, or seeing them in action and 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 actually, you know, trying to relive the movie yourself afterwards. Oh, I want to I want to bring it down so it's easy to understand. Am I correct in in hearing you say that a mentor is not only teaching hard skills, but they're most likely teaching those soft skills. The subject content and in, in not just knowing the facts about the subject, but also in that emotional intelligence, knowing how to deliver it. So it's, it's those things that are expected of young people when they go to work, but nowhere along that academic journey does it really fall into any of the modules of the hard skills that they're going to be learning. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. And I would say that if anything with AI, it's going to be doing a lot of the hard skill stuff, right? Which makes the soft skill part even more important. So yes, absolutely, one hundred percent. Brilliant. I could keep going on forever. I'm gonna I'm gonna start bringing it to a wrap. Kevin, you have extensive experience across multiple platforms. What stood out the most for me is the uh, adaptability between places and and people that you've had the ability to be working with. Definitely something that young people need to really pay attention to in a globalized world. What were some of your greatest learnings working with a variety of different people and places? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think in many ways, the different cultures that you're immersed in, right? People work very differently, very, very differently. And, you know, understand that maybe the education system that you were brought up in, right, might be different to the new environment that you're put into. So a good example of this might actually be when I was working in Myanmar for a while. Um, I found that a lot of the local Myanmar staff were very comfortable responding on email, but didn't like talking up in meetings. So my, my role there was half the time on the ground in Myanmar, half the time in Hong Kong. And I actually found that sometimes the communication was better with, when I was in Hong Kong because they had to write over email as opposed to talk to me in person. Right. So, you know, I guess I then adapted by even when I was in Myanmar in the office, I'd still email them anyway, even though the person is right opposite me, because I found that that was the most effective method of communication. So I think culture is a big one. Right. And, and as you have more international experience, you will create more reference points in your heads. 
Um, again, that's not to necessarily stereotype, but that's maybe a guide at the beginning, right? And then I think with each person, you tailor your strategy, but it gives you a good starting point for people from different parts of the world. So I think that's, uh, that's really important. I think the other thing I would also say in terms of you know, working with people from international kind of backgrounds or backgrounds that are different to you is that also advocate listening. And I think it's very easy to be like, hey, here's my ideas. I want to put them forward and that's the way I, it needs to be. Um, but I think just pulling the handbrake on that a little bit and just listening to what people have to say will often give you more information to make good decisions. Uh, I think at the beginning, I was trying to always, you know, uh, just put my voice forward straight away. Uh, but I realized the value of listening um, kind of uh, kind of going forward there too. So I'd say listening number two. And then I think building emotional resilience. I think we mentioned that a little bit before. And I do think that, you know, different uh, countries and, and different people build emotional resilience in different ways. Uh, some people like to, you know, run into a tough situation, you know, the burning building and build their, build their emotional resilience that way. Uh, other people like to take more of a cautious measured approach. So I, I'm not advocating one over the other, but what I would say is um, gaining the self-awareness about yourself is, is really important. Some of those reference points for self-awareness may come from different people from different parts of the world. But I think once you're more self-aware about yourself, you start to understand, you know, what situations do you well, what do you do well in, what situations do you not, and then you're able to calibrate. So if there was one kind of final piece, I think calibration is really important. Because I think when people are, are or you're, when you're working with different people, it's, it's not always one style that's going to work. Like you need to be able to calibrate to certain situations and to certain people. And I think where folks who have an international background or have worked in many different places are really good is that they're able to calibrate well. So it's not even just, you know, they have great people skills. They have good people skills for this situation, and then they have good people skills for that situation. So calibration, again, I think really important there too. Brilliant. Total gem, uh, gem pieces of information. Thank you, Kevin. And I know I promised that was my last question, but I am going to ask you one more. There might sure. be an educator watching this right now. What are some of the big uh, red flags that you think educators have to pay more attention to if they want to prepare young people for, the, for future careers? Yeah, I, I could actually go on for this for a long time. Um, if I had to kind of summarize a few things. I'd say number one, um, be mindful that the students you have today are going to enter a very different world than you did, right? Which means that the, that the skills they have and the things that they learn are probably going to be very different to what you had in the future, right? Or what you had in the past. And that's true not only for you, but that's probably also true for the children's parents as well, which is then going to be a challenge, right? Because how because the kids need to know stuff and this, the parents may not necessarily be comfortable straight away with that. So I think that's one of the challenges we're going to have to embrace. How do we change education so that it arms students with the right skills and the right kind of tools uh, that, that will be useful for their future? So I think that's number one. Uh, I think number two, uh, we need to kind of emphasize a little bit more the soft skills that we've been talking about. Um, but I understand the educator's challenge of how do you assess these? But I think that's one of the big reasons why it's hard to just teach one full day of creativity because how do you measure that? So if I could maybe, you know, uh, nudge educators a little bit is think about how do we assess some of these softer skills? I think if we get the assessments right, uh, a lot of things down the line will change, you know, and whether these are uh, you know, short term or long term, I, I think it's, it, we need both. Um, but if we can assess these skills, this will be better. And finally, if we can assess them better, they can then be used for criteria for maybe higher education as well, which I think will then pull the system towards uh, uh, having people learn or having young people learn the things they really should. Because if, for example, the criteria at top universities becomes you need creativity, you need to be able to build trust, et cetera, I think automatically schools and everything down the line will move towards helping that out as well. So I think even educators at the higher levels, if they can move a little bit more of their selection criteria towards some of these soft skills, I think that would be fantastic. So what I'm hearing you say is schools need to be more in touch with the changes that are going on in the world and really look at not just the content of what they're teaching, but also the, the delivery of how they're teaching. And, and it also sounds to me like teachers, educators, and parents need to be comfortable on learning their old beliefs and relearning some of the new and staying on top of these new trends. Would you say that that um, is important? 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I do think, you know, teachers might have to, uh, yeah, unlearn some, some things for sure. Uh, and what I would actually say as a little piece of advice for, for some teachers, uh, something that I've done is I've looked at some of the sort of more non-traditional education um, curriculum that's out there. So I see, for example, what they're doing in the Scandinavian countries, right? And uh, in some cases, you know, there, there are education models where they don't provide homework or they allow kids to play with each other more to build these social skills, et cetera. And if you ultimately look at the final pieces of data that come out of that, uh, if you look at standardized test scores, for example, the results are similar to maybe other areas where they emphasize rote learning and, you know, a more traditional methods. So if ultimately the final result is similar and the kids are less stressed, have more time to play, are enjoying their lives more, um, you know, perhaps that's, that's, that's a reason to think about, uh, you know, what can we change and what are they doing in some of those models that might work in our models. So, yeah, I think the retraining part definitely can be done. And I think some teachers can print or instructors can think about, you know, what are models that work, work elsewhere and how could we incorporate some of the good things in, in what we do. I think we're weaving into a whole new conversation. I definitely want to pick this up with you again in the future. But Kevin, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you for sharing your career insights and taking us down that story of your career journey as well. It's been amazing to be on this conversation with you. Thank you very much for having me. Really appreciate it. And that brings us to the end of another incredible conversation. Today, we were speaking with Kevin Pereira, who is the Managing Director of Blue Artificial Intelligence. Not only did we talk about his career journey, but we also tapped into some of the elements that might be helpful for educators, parents, and young people when thinking about some of those hard and soft skills that they want to be focusing on and adapting to as they get closer to their future careers. I will see you all at my next Let's Talk Careers with Miss V. Thank you for watching.